Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, yeah, te kura wa Waiheke is really excited to be able to host this webinar. So, yeah, welcome to you all and um, thanks thanks for joining us. Um, for those that don't know us, Te Kura wa Waiheke is a charitable trust that was established by the community on Waiheke Island to remove stoats and rats. And so currently we're leading a stoat eradication. And in two weeks' time, we start the operational side of our rat pilot, which will help us to learn how to remove rats from Waiheke. Uh, and I, I'm the project director for Te Kurawai, and I can see that some of our um, some of our fantastic staff are with us here as well. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Araceli Samaniego to share with us um, the factors leading to successful island rodent eradications. Particularly interested in that. <laughs> um, Araceli is a conservation biologist with 20 years of experience. And she started as a project manager in Mexico, which is where she hails from, um, where she led uh, numerous conservation projects on islands, including 12 rodent eradications. Um, but by now, she's made contributions around the world, including Australia, Belize, Canada, Fiji, French Polynesia, the UK, the USA, and I think the list goes on. <laughs> Um, for the last wee while, New Zealand's been very lucky to have her based here, um, and her PhD uh, was from Auckland University, focusing on the ecology of invasive rodents on tropical islands. Uh, and uh, now she works at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research eradication projects around the globe. So Araceli is going to take us through the findings that she and her colleagues outlined in a recent review on rodent eradications on islands, uh, where they compared environmental and operational factors using global cases where rodent eradication initially failed and where subsequent attempts succeeded. So as I said before, I'm particularly interested <laughs> in what might explain the initial failures and if it's possible to get it right the first time. So bienvenida, Araceli, and um, yeah, looking forward mm -hmm. to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. That's lovely. Um, so what I'm going to do now, but clunky, is we're going to put you back in your Waiheke box by just clicking you off the screen. Um, you may w wish to thank her, Araceli, first before we get rid of her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Mary, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Lovely. Thank you. See you, Mary. We'll talk to you at the end. The rest now is up to you. I just sit back and Araceli, you do your thing. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, well, thanks again for the invitation. And um, let's get straight into these factors leading to successful eradications. I have to click on, sorry. There we go. So island eradications are a proven tool to restore species and ecosystems. And um, as you can see here, this work has been successfully implemented on a variety of islands, countries, regions of the world. Um, there are actually around 600 cases, uh, successful cases of uh, rodent eradications. Um, the number grows every year, fortunately, and you'll be pleased that New Zealand is considered not only the pioneer, but also the champion in the world. This is actually um, like a summary um, of the eradication effort uh, in New Zealand over time. And really the point is just to mention that um, the concept is not new. And in fact, it wasn't until the 90s, as you can see here, that these really took off. But what explains this? Uh, what happened around this time that um, changed the curve? Well, it had to do with uh, two major things. First, advances in technology, uh, such as uh, the use of helicopters uh, to target, um, to distribute bait on increasingly larger islands. Uh, new bait buckets, um, so the buckets we use today are really precise, very reliable compared to the, uh, the initial ones that came from agricultural work. Um, things like the um, bait palatability was improved, um, new toxicants were developed, so all this helped tremendously. But equally important was the development of eradication theory. And in simple terms, this means um, 
or meant the creation of eradication principles, which apply to any island eradication, um, and then a series of be best practice guidelines. Depending on the technique we are using, um, the target species, the um, type of uh, environment or ecosystem we're working on. So these three, for example, are the main um, methods for um, rodent eradications uh, globally. And so it's about having a guide on what we need to do exactly on the ground during the eradication in a way that we meet all of the eradication principles, which um, we know for sure is the best way to maximize our chances of success. Now, putting all this uh, together was an impressive amount of work uh, from the um, advisory group, the Island Eradication Advisory Group from DOC, and um, we need to thank a lot of countries um, for that effort to help not only New Zealand, but really uh, the world. So with, with those um, lessons, compiled lessons from, from failures and successes, it's that a lot of other countries that started a bit later the eradication work, um, well, started with the right foot, uh, really. So I'm going to briefly touch um, around Mexico because it's my home country. And I worked for over a decade for Conservación de Islas, a Mexican organization. So as you can see here in green, there is a lot of um, good, good work I already implemented, some, some pending work as well. And um, the, the organization is still going strong, targeting everything from mice and rats to larger species with an impressive 100% um, success uh, so far as I said, following um, Kiwi advice. My own journey started in 2002. Um, I was just really lucky. I was uh, finishing my master's looking for my first job and just happened to get involved in, um, in a rat eradication. And of course, I loved it. It was super exciting um, being able to make a difference on the ground. And the rest is history. I just um, got a full-time position. I started leading projects um, in Mexico and also started uh, doing uh, international collaborations with um, many organizations in different regions of the world. I spent last winter on Gulf Island and um, my title has kind of changed and um, from project manager to PhD student to consultant. And, conservation scientist these, day, these days at uh, Manaki Fenua. But the whole time, really, the focus has been not only about getting rid of the invasives, which it's uh, an important thing in itself, but also how can we do this work better every time? What can we learn um, so we are more efficient, we are faster, cheaper, um, and with less issues um, every time? So that would... That's what keep, keeps me going because every island is different. So we always have new challenges and um, that's really fun as well. Just keep us motivated. And really good community to work with. Uh, what happened there? Right. So with this um, background, um, I hope you, you can understand why I was a bit skeptical when I heard things like, well, it seems like Mice in particular are um, super difficult to um, eradicate or um, there is something weird with tropical islands because there is all these failures in different countries. So it must be something about the tropical environment. And I was like, well, that's not really my experience because in Mexico we are targeting mice. Oh, in case you are interested, this is a mouse with a radio tag. Uh, this was part of my PhD research. So in Mexico, we were targeting mice. We were mostly working on tropical islands, and we were hand, having a um, hundred percent success. So I thought, well, um, maybe there is another explanation to these failures. So a bit later on, um, a, a group of us trying to 
explore more, more into this issue, um, we actually looked at the success rate of mouse eradication. Now, these are um, global data. And um, as you can see here, um, yes, it's been bumpy, it's been kind of ups and downs um, in terms of uh, success, um, but success is represented with blue. And as you can see, the, the last few years has been just fantastic. Uh, lots of successes, even on large islands for mice. And if anything, the rate of success um, in the last uh, couple of decades, it's actually better than um, for rat eradications. Although noting that there are a lot more cases for rats than for mice. That is changing though. So uh, this was really cool to see. And, and actually it was just confirming um, what others have found as well um, from other studies and, and reviews in the last few years. Uh, for example, look at this work on mice. So this is uh, lessons from New Zealand. And I just love this, this line that I'm, I'm going to quickly read. It says, eradicating mice from islands is not as difficult as previously thought if, and this is a really important part, if best, sorry, if best practices, um, best practice techniques are applied with diligent planning and implementation. So that really sums um, this talk. <laughs> um, this is really important. Targeting any species, this is, this is just the key. A good planning um, that leads to good implementation. So jumping quickly to the um, topic of tropical islands. Um, this is one of the um, reviews that highlighted the issue and actually suggested, after some uh, statistical analysis, um, suggested that these three factors in particular um, appear to be um, correlated to failure in the tropics. And this is the presence of coconuts, land crabs, and agriculture. I think uh, mostly self-explanatory. I'm just going to mention that land crabs can be super abundant and, and they love the bait and they can consume large quantities of bait, um, sometimes more bait than rats or mice per day. So they are a real issue. And others also suggested that it was mainly um, because of the nice weather in, in tropical areas, um, rats and mice would be able to breathe all year round and maybe it was something about the diet of uh, females like black lactating or pregnant females uh, that were being picky and maybe avoiding eating the bait. So all that made sense um, but we really wanted to explore more in detail and, and uh, do some experimental work. So again another uh, <clears throat> international collaboration I uh, was lucky enough to, to get invited to this work. And then we found an island, a tropical evergreen island in French Polynesia, where we found all of the issues at the same time. So the idea was to um, study uh, all of them really closely and see what was going on in the tropics. So it was a really interesting research case. It was a bit scary being the project manager on of an island that had lots and lots of rats um, reproducing all year round. We found juveniles every month, everywhere, lots of coconuts, um, land crabs of all sizes. Here are the small hermit crabs and also lots of the largest land crabs that you could ever see. So that was really cool. We conducted an experimental eradication and the short story is that we managed to get rid of the rats really quickly, actually, surprisingly quickly. Um, this is just rat activity measured by trail cameras. And the point is that a, a rat activity was kind of constant just before the, the application of bait. And then um, the day we apply bait, uh, we did this by hand, um, the activity just crashed. And actually, we had zero activity by one week later, um, which is the time we did the second application. So it went really well. 
Oh, <laughs> with the footage of the trail cameras, we put together a video that unfortunately I can't play here. Um, but if you go to YouTube and look for a successful Pacific rat eradication, you'll, you'll see a five minute uh, video from the Rio no Island. I recommend it for all the Wahiki people because it stars Dr. Marcus that you know well. So thank you, Marcus, for all your help on that research. So uh, we produced papers uh, from the from this research. The first one, it's more about all the sciencey bits. Um, the second one, um, available for free on uh, passive, uh, conservation evidence, it's um, more about the operational uh, the operational factor. So what was important and how we planned and how we implemented this eradication. So we really wanted to pay attention on bay distribution because we were actually using low bay rates um, and we were um, betting on a really good distribution to, to solve the problem and, and it did. So everything went well. The overall conclusion of all this research is that in the tropics, despite abundant natural food and high density of reproductive rats, um, we can have successful eradications. So that was great, but then didn't really explain all these other failures uh, of um, other themes um, across the world. So to explore further the importance of human error and to actually identify the factors leading to uh, successful eradications, I team up with a um, super group of practitioners. Um, you might recognize some of these names um, actually, uh, these are people more experienced than myself, and collectively, this group has been involved with pretty much any major eradication in the last 10 years or so. So I was pretty lucky to be working with people of this caliber. So we got to work, and what we did was to identify and study in, in all the detail possible. We talked to people involved. Again, uh, most of us were um, had been involved personally with uh, these projects, so we knew a lot of the even the detail that doesn't get published and things like that. So we identified and studied islands that were um, um, where eradication failed um, in the first attempt, but later on. Um, was attempted again and was successful. So we have the same island with two different results. What changed? It was great that we had, so in total, we worked with 35 um, operations um, across eight countries. And as you can see, we had a, a, like a good distribution in terms of uh, type of islands and environments. We also had a good uh, variation um, in um, island size, uh, vegetation, topography, and whatnot. Good variety. The target species, the useful suspects, house mice, uh, Pacific rats, sheep rats, and Norway rats. Uh, sometimes more than one species at a time, so multi-eradication species. And now, because of time, I'm going to uh, give you three examples. Um, but I think it's a good illustration on the type of issues we found and the type of changes that we found uh, across this attempt. So the first example is around, it's about Isabel Island in Mexico. And the first attempt, the failed one, um, was done with bait stations during the rainy season by people that didn't have much experience and it failed um, right away. There was no time without, without rats, actually. Now, a few years later, um, our team in Mexico um, just had a, an, another go. And first we review what, uh, how it was done before and we decided that we had to change everything. So we changed, it was a different team to start with, 
But then we changed the bait. Instead of bait stations, we used a helicopter because there was no other way to properly bait these cliffs, for example, in some of the patches of vegetation that are, are just impenetrable, really. I should say that um, there is a small fisherman camp. Uh, it's not in the picture, but there are allowed about 100 people living there. Other thing that changed is that we operated during the dry season instead of the wet season. So it was much easier for us to operate uh, for obvious reasons. You can see the big change here. But it was also um, operationally a more stressful time for the rats. So we knew that was in, in our favor. And now you might say, well, maybe it's not everything that you change and the methods and the bait, but it was simply that the rats were more stressful uh, during the dry season. So in these cases, we couldn't separate one or the other. So surely everything um, had, um, um, had some weight, um, but it, it's difficult to, to separate. Now, the good thing is that we had another category of islands where actually the opposite happened. So uh, this is um, the Wawa in the Marquesas. And much of the time looks like this. Um, looks like a smallish, um, simplish um, island. And it was uh, attempted um, more than once, actually. Um, yeah, at least twice. Um, different people tried to eradicate rats from here and they failed. Um, despite operating in really dry conditions with um, almost no birds nesting and things like that. Now, by the time the other group, oh, right, um, by the time the um, the other group operated. Um, it's a really long story on why they ended up operating um, with such uh, green and lush conditions. But the point is that they, they did and they were successful. So despite this failed operation um, happening with um, poor conditions for the rats, and the contrary was true for um, these uh, Green Island, where there was lots of um, invertebrates for the rats. The um, seabirds were breeding, so that means also more food for the rats. This operation was successful. And the point is that even, even using the same technique, so um, bait stations here, but this operation was of a really high quality. So the, the grid was a, a perfect systematic grid, uh, well done, and really good quality bait. The cliffs were baited um, properly. Um, so the whole operation was similar, but uh, just higher quality, worse conditions, um, but it was successful. So that's really good to see these cases. And then the third example and the third case, it's around islands that have no real seasonality. It's always rainy, it's always nice and green <laughs> and beautiful. So this is the Seychelles. And this is an island, um, as with a few others, um, that have people uh, living there. Um, not massive amounts, uh, but in this case, uh, this island, it's a um, luxury resort. So all these areas in red are areas where you would find human structures. And so just imagine what you need to run a, a luxury hotel. So buildings of different kinds, uh, lots of storage, gardens, and um, so on. Staff living there permanently, um, some agriculture and, and whatnot. So this work was done with a helicopter because of the, again, the size and the cliffs inclination. It was the only way to secure a uh, good bay distribution. And in this case, it seems that the problem in the failed attempt was that the inhabited area was not treated properly. As in, not every building uh, was baited and then mm, the, um, some of the, the green waste was just piled up 
you know, we just imagine like a huge pile of coconuts and things like that, and it was not completely removed, things like that. So for the second attempt, all that improved. Again, really similar operations, same bait, same technique, um, pretty much the same people involved. It was just a higher quality operation. Uh, being very cautious about baiting uh, human infrastructure, removing um, all the green waste, uh, or making sure that there was no access to the rats, and that made the trick. The operation was successful. So we have three um, general questions uh, for this review. So the first one, can operational flaws explain the failures? And the answer was mostly yes. And it's mostly, instead of plain yes, um, because of the cases um, that I showed at the beginning with um, Isabel, that in some cases it was just impossible to uh, separate how important was the environmental conditions, the change in environmental conditions versus the change on operational factors. Then we asked, can operational improvements in subsequent attempts explain the successes? And again, the answer was mostly yes. And lastly, is it worth reattempting islands with initial, initial failures? And well, definitely yes. Um, close to 90% of the um, cases that we reviewed were successful, mostly in the second attempt. Um, a few had to go to a third attempt to um, be successful. And the only two or three that were not successful despite two or three attempts, it's because they kept having issues uh, with implementation mainly, um, especially around having gaps in bay distribution. That was the main issue. So I would love to, at some point, be, being able to, to try to do these eradications, uh, those that are still pending, um, just to prove that um, with high standards, it can be done. Now, this, uh, this is a summary of all the potential reasons for eradication failure that we found, not only based on our review, but also based on our own experience as practitioners. And it's, um, don't worry, I'm not going to read every box, and it's, it's not that really important. The point is that there are a lot of potential reasons, and it's usually more than one present, and some are quite related. Um, and, um, but everything at the end of the day can be associated to the eradication principles. So here with the asterisks are um, the factors that can indicate a violation to the eradication principles, which I know I haven't shown. So here they are. These are the, the, the core three principles. Um, there is also an extended list but these are really the most important. So all target animals must be put at risk by the eradication technique or techniques. Sometimes we have more than one happening. Removal must exceed the rate of increase of the target species at all densities. And immigration must be zero in the short and the long term. Now, finally, this is a list of um, all the factors that we found to be important uh, leading to success. And again, it's not about reading um, each one. It's, it's I really wanted to uh, visualize that we have two major uh, boxes, the planning and implementation. And, um, and as we put here in these boxes, that the importance of good planning just cannot be overstated. It's the only way just by having a good plan that is reviewed, that has expert advice, um, that you, just, just by over-engineering your um, operation, that you can have a chance to have a good implementation. So it's about the planning that sometimes takes um, experimentation. Um, you really need to know your system because truly it's, it's really, <laughs> true that every island is different. Um, and it's still, we still have a lot to learn. And of course, without realistic funding and permits, you don't, you don't go 
uh, very far. So it's just once you have all these um, well planned um, that then you can move to a, a good quality implementation. And we've seen also examples of operations having a good plan, but implemented uh, by people that don't have much experience and um, sometimes um, problems arise or unexpected things happen and then it's difficult to react when um, there is not enough experience present on the ground. So I'm looking at time, sorry. So I'll just quickly, I'm about to finish. So this is a really just diagram that I thought it would be useful for you to see, just to visualize um, how we go about planning these projects. So the feasibility study is something that is uh, commonly underestimated. People see it uh, as a waste of time or like, oh, I can go straight to the operational plan or straight to the implementation, which is down here. And no, especially for large complex projects, it's feasibility study um, is just super important. It's the stage where you ask, could this be actually done? And what would it take? And only when you have, only when you are happy with the answers to those questions, then you know if you can move ahead, then you have clarity on what you need to answer because the, you, the question to the, the answer to the second question is just really kind of like, well, yeah, it could be done, but we need to know this and that, or we need to do this and that. And then you have clarity, you do that, and then when everything is ready, then you go to the operational um, stage where you write the operational plan, and then finally move to implementation with all these other layers on top, like biosecurity needs to start from day one. So this is it really. I just want to close with uh, a quote that says, failing to plan is planning for failure. So imagine if we go to the engineer side of things. We actually talk a lot about over-engineering because we see it like that. Uh, we are building things. And when you are building something that is like way out there, out of the chart, different to anything else that has been done before, it's great that, that you want to do um, something <laughs> more difficult than um, anything else because the sky is the limit, right, at the end of the day. But to me, it's obvious that doing something like this requires a lot more planning and preparation than anything else done before. And ideally, you want to help and the advice and the involvement of the people that have built um, the previous um, similar work. So with that, I'll thank you for listening and I'll take questions. Fantastic. Can you go to a project that's happening and can can you almost straight away tell if there is an issue with the planning and implementation? Do you get a feel straight away of whether things are going right uh, with groups that you come in contact with? Uh, yes, it changes a lot, a lot with the level of the challenge, of course. Um, but it is <laughs> once you've done quite a few, it um, it gets relatively easy to to know because it always starts with the mindset. So I think there are three. If you ask me for three key keywords, I would say mindset, teamwork, um, and quality. Quality of everything. And the mindset is the first one. So if, and, and that is the one that you can tell really quickly. If there is people that right away, like I get a call kind of every year with something like, oh, there is this island, and this kind of smallish, so it's easy. And um, I have this money, like, can we go next month? And then just, you know, chuck some bait and that's it. It's like, okay, well, that's not the right mindset. It's like, no. <laughs> so it, people that are, you can tell right away when people are asking the right questions and really if I if they are really interested to um, to do things in a proper way, not really rushing it because the permit, you know, it's about to expire or I need to use the funding by this month. And these are just so common issues that sometimes is reality yes but it, it's about how to engage in, in the importance to give to 
really doing your best um, to meet the eradication principles. A couple of questions coming on through now. Um, what does successful eradication, what does it mean? Um, is it the total eradication of the rat population? And it's and this came because the person said, sorry, I, I may have missed uh, the answer during the presentation. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I should have um, say that like super clearly, but yes, um, for maybe everybody that I showed in the screen and papers and whatnot, for all of us, eradication means zero. Zero animals left of any kind um, and keeping it like that. In As I said, in the short, in the short, in the long term, uh, you do that by having good biosecurity. But yeah, so just to be super clear, um, there are two main concepts. So it's eradication and then control. So eradication means leaving no animals behind, no animals, and, and then control meaning keeping animals at low levels. Now there are di different types of control, but that's a major difference. Um some of these questions will just sort of zigzag across different um, subject matter. But Billy's asked, uh, do you use drones for bait drops? That's something really new that is happening. I haven't used it personally, but I'm currently planning uh, on, on doing that. And um, there's a really um, good company, um, Enviroco. Uh, so it's a Kiwi company, the only one that has done baiting for an eradication on an island. Um, they are doing it this year in a couple of tropical islands, actually. And yes, I'm talking to them to uh, do some other experimental work, actually. So I'm really excited. And a lot of this technology is just coming on now, really, isn't it? It's a perfect time. And quite a lot of it comes out of New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think at this stage, drones are the perfect solution for islands that are just a bit too large to be done by hand, mm. but a bit too small to be worth the helicopter. So really only in New Zealand, um, you can have the luxury of having lots of helicopter companies to choose from, and then, then kind of just right there. Uh, most countries uh, don't have that luxury. So it's, it's really difficult to get a uh, um, good combination of the right equipment with the right pilot, because that's another important piece, having the right pilot. And um, it's difficult for most countries. So drones um, could have a, a really good niche in these between operations, the tiny ones that are done by hand, and then the drone ones, <laughs> let's say, and then the really large ones um, have to be done with helicopters. No, no doubt. Mike Dixon asks, uh, were the eradications purely bait drop and monitoring based, or was there an element of manual trapping as well? No trapping other than for monitoring purposes. So mainly uh, beforehand, I do a lot of mal recapture work, for example. But uh, no, these days, it was trial ages ago. Uh, never worked. <laughs> My work in, a, in an island of like one hectare or something, but I would not recommend doing any trapping. And it's not necessary. I know some groups in French tend to do that, still kind of doing some trapping right before baiting, it's just not necessary. You just tire your people, your team, before the actual work. Right. Um, here's one that said, uh, just wondering, for radi uh, eradication bait, does it have to be second generation bait? Also thoughts on half-life of baits? Second generation baits, I definitely most efficient, so more reliable. There are some examples of successes doing uh, with using first generation anticoagulants, but by definition, because they are less toxic, the risk is higher. So it depends on your systems. It, it could be manageable in some cases, um, but definitely working with second generations is safe, safer operationally. I know that um, there are potential issues with non-targets, but again, we we are getting better and better and mitigating those impacts. And also, new types of baits, as 
species-specific uh, toxins are, are being developed, and it's part of the experimental work we are planning at the moment. Um, your flowcharts uh, proved to be very popular, and somebody has asked, um, they'd love to have access <laughs> to those wonderful flowcharts that you put up. Um, is there some way they can do that? Um, yeah, well, I think the presentation is going to be available, right? So if you just Google the title of the paper, uh, it's open access, meaning it's free. So you can just, just search for the title and it will take you to the, um, to the journal. But because it's open access, you can just download it. And I think right. there is a, a, a way to download the figures um, in high quality. Um, remember too, we're recording this, and so you'll be able to go back and push pause and um, look at it on screens for anybody who would like to do that as well. Um, here we go, another one here. Um, what do you think are the main obstacles that will be to a successful rat eradication program on an island like Waiheke, uh, relative to other island eradication programs? It's a big question, but um, have a thought on that. <laughs> Yeah, um, the inhabited component, um, it's the one that it's the main difference to, well, not just the, the, the scale as in island size, but that means just more bait and maybe more helicopter time. It's really um, the size of the human component that is different in the bits that are related to that. because. The largest so far, it's uh, Lord Howe, Lord Howe Island in Australia. But even that, so that was kind of like a step, step up <laughs> from, from inhabited islands. And um, Wahiki would be like a way, way another big step. So it's about, it has to be teamwork. There is, there is again, one of the key works. <laughs> um, teamwork, everybody understanding um, why things are being proposed and why things need to happen like in certain time frame and with um, certain quality in terms of being applied. So, so I guess it's about um, informing everybody and, um, and once that is achieved, like everybody agreed that the final goal is more important than anything else, which is having just no no um, rats and wahiki, uh, then I'm sure there will be a, a way to um, find a way that um, the work can be done around um, human structure. But it's, it's definitely, <laughs> it, it would be good. Like if you ask people from Lord Howell today, I'm sure everybody would say, oh, it was not as intrusive as I thought it would be. Oh, it's not that bad. We hear those comments all the time. So, oh, is that it? Have you, are you done? It's like, oh, I thought it was going to be like, you know, a lot more uh, noisier and, and more complex. And um, it's not. That's that's the thing that if, as, as I showed in in the graph, when we have when we have no issues as in like human structure, so things like need like special treatment, this work can be done really quickly in a few days. So. The more you compromise techniques and the more you compromise meeting those principles is when projects became longer. So and learn how instead of one week for the operation, uh, six months were needed. But that was the difference. Like having to do manually um, houses and gardens in, in going around cattle and whatnot. So the more we can remove those obstacles, the quicker it could be and everybody would be happier. Yeah, everyone being on the same page, isn't it? Everybody following exactly. the plan. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Sue then asked, uh, I'd like to ask a similar question, but on a larger scale, and what's your thoughts on the main obstacles that will be to a successful rat eradication of the whole islands of New Zealand? That's huge, isn't it? That's like everywhere has different, maybe everywhere has a different um, uh, problem that they're going to find. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a major one that I don't think has been answered, really. I know there are some projects that are already um, 
ongoing and um but how to connect even if no one has been actually successful um but even if if you manage to do this in the, in like different separated spots and how to eventually like you now unite all those areas um it hasn't been resolved so I, it's not that i have the answer to that um what i would say is that it needs a lot more thinking and um planning and input from um from people that have like, like really good experience in that so yeah the short answer is i don't think there is um a good strategy at the moment but you would learn, wouldn't you, from um, a project like what is happening on Waiheke? They would be the best way to uh, baby steps this whole thing for the whole country, isn't it? You start with a Waiheke and then you oh, yeah, no. move, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, perfect. And um, sorry, I think I didn't even say that I, I applaud that I'm not directly involved with the Waiheke project, but um, from what I know, it's it's really great that they are uh, really taking the approach of being cautious and um, doing some trials um, and, and trying to do really good planning. So that's why I'm, I'm very happy to be involved, at least in this in this way, um, giving a talk and, and say, well, I really think this is the, the way to go. Um, the good thing in Wahiki is that it's an island at the end of the day. So in terms of once the work is done and how to keep it rat free, it's an island. So as long as you you can have good biosecurity, I know it's easier said than done. <laughs> but with good biosecurity, uh, you can keep your island rat free. As with again, hundreds of islands um, are still uh, rodent free after many years on eradication. The problem with them with the main island is um, the reinvasion problem. So even if we find a way of being successful. Um, um, let's say with uh, large operations of um, even a new, even if we get a new toxicant, um, we still don't have a, a good way of keeping each area free and then increasing that. So still work to do on that space. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, David asks, are you aware of the uh, Gough Island eradication attempt? Yes, you are. I know you are. Uh, New Zealanders were involved. David mentioned yeah. this project at the start of the talk. He put down heaps of planning, but it failed. I'm not sure why, he said. Do you know why? That's the question. <laughs> well, this definitely is not the official answer because um, it's a recent case and um, a review is taking place. But I was there and we did some um, research. Uh, what I can tell you is that we had some unexpected issues. So um, especially with invasive slugs. And actually we have a, a paper that is in, in review at the moment um, explaining um, where those issues were, uh, which is basically lots of slugs um, eating lots of our bait. So that was an issue that we were not expecting on the day that could have been detected before. So that was actually a gap um, in the planning. Right. If we, if we knew about that issue, we would have done some things differently for the implementation. That's the problem that with rodents, because we have such a small time frame to act, everything has to be pre-prepared. Um, changes on the day um, can be done, but you don't have that much room to play. That's great. Well, it sounds like that's our questions for today, um, and the timing's perfect. Um, I was just going to, I, yeah, oh, there we go. Yes, Sue wrote, thanks for your answer. I love what you've been doing and what everyone here is doing in Waiheke. Lots to learn mm -hmm. for New Zealand as a whole too. That's sort of what I was going to ask you. It was a bit like 
you know, it's such new ground for Waiheke. They're all working hard. There's some people putting so much effort into it. Uh, Mary, who you saw before, I mean, it's it's a daily thing for her to organise people and organise things. And Jenny, who Jenny Holmes, who I'm working with a wee bit, um, the passion's all there. What would you say finally to this really wonderful community group doing so much work, um, and to the people that have given up their time to watch? this webinar and get more insight and maybe a bit more direction of what's happening. What would you say to them as your parting words as an expert? <laughs> well, I would say um, keep the good work with the planning. Um, it's about, it's when you know in detail your island and all the potential things that can go wrong, that you can find ways on uh, mitigating that, correcting those issues. Um, and uh, I know it's complex, it's it pressures, um, time funding and whatnot, but don't, don't rush it. I think that's my main advice, just don't rush it. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for your time and, uh, and your knowledge and your presentation. Um, Araceli Samanego, which I think <laughs> we nearly got right. Um, we've all been practicing your name right. all day, and, I, and <laughs> I've had the worst go at it, really. Um, I thank very much to Mary Frankham, who introduced you, and also to the team uh, that I've been working with, Jenny, and also um, the people that have uh, tuned into this uh, for tonight. Good luck with all your future um, uh, projects. What are you off to do now? What's your next project? In the field, uh, we are currently actually um, looking for small islands so that they are manageable um, to do some experimental work with um, these species-specific toxins. So right. that might take, take me to the UK and to the Pacific again. Oh, good, but bring all your knowledge back to us because we just need people like you keeping us on track. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nick, and uh, everybody for listening. Great. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, keep up the great work on that beautiful island, Waiheke. And we will see you again um, for our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you.